Hello, I'm here with Professor Tim Canova from Chapman University, Professor of International Economic Law, and Andres Arauz from the Central Bank of Ecuador. Th gentlemen, thank you very much for joining me here. Okay. Um, I want to ask you, what do you think the most important thing for people not necessarily educated in what's happening in the crisis, what do you think the most important thing to know is for those people? That's for you. Go yeah, ahead. Well, as far as the origins of the crisis, uh, that it came about as a result of uh, an extremely deregulated environment where uh, government regulators and Congress itself have been corrupted by Wall Street money and influence. Um, moving forward, looking forward into the future, I think uh, perhaps the most important thing that needs to be done that's not being spoken about is to have public jobs programs and that the public sector has responsibilities to put a floor under this economy and it has not been doing that. Right. I think um, it's also very important to highlight that crises aren't accidents. They, they aren't uh, some, something like earthquakes. Uh, they have a very, uh, we can definitely detect who, who is responsible. This is a man-made uh, event, and uh, I think that uh, people should be conscious of, of that with the respective social and political response that it requires. How do you suggest we go about detecting the crisis so that when the next one rolls around, we're not caught thinking that this is something that was just unavoidable? How do you think we should go about doing that? Uh, well, I think the the job, I mean, the symposium today is a, is a very, very excellent opportunity to study uh, what the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission did exactly. I mean, we can detect uh, some of the elements that were present, the origins of the crises, and look for them uh, in, in today's situation. And also study other crises. I mean, part of what my talk was about was uh, uh, the situation of Latin America and how we have had crises. And, and you can definitely see a pattern there of, of previous uh, legal changes and regulatory changes and, and certain uh, behaviors by on the side of the financial system that you can definitely detect and then try to regulate and prevent. Professor Canova, do you have anything to well, I, I think the next crisis is already unavoidable because I don't think there's been um, very far-reaching reforms of the financial system right now. We see a crisis that's unfolding in Europe, um, again, in large part because of um, the forces of predatory finance that, uh, that go unregulated. There's still an enormous casino economy, an enormous market in derivatives. Um, today's conference really showed um, the problems in derivatives and... Uh, uh, that the state should not really be uh, uh, upholding these types of gambling contracts. Um, a number of speakers spoke about that. And what type of reforms would you like to see for Europe right now, especially? Well, well Europe's an interesting uh, case. Um, we have we see in Europe a currency union, but not a fiscal union. And um, the United States is a currency union. You know, New York and Alabama and 50, uh, 50 states are all in the same currency union. But it's also a fiscal union. So uh, Congress, uh, which exercises fiscal policy by taxing and spending, can even out the problems between regions. That doesn't happen in, in Europe. So all of these disparate countries are in the same currency union. And the effect of the common currency of the euro is much different on Germany than on Greece and Italy, for instance. So the euro is a much weaker currency than would be the Deutschmark if we just had national currencies in Europe. And as a result, it helps German exporters tremendously. Meanwhile, the euro is a much stronger currency than would be uh, the Greek drachma or the Italian lira. So for those countries, that already don't have the same kind of infrastructure that Germany does, it doesn't have the same kind of educated workforce ready to compete, they're at an even bigger disadvantage by having a stronger currency than they're ready for. So I've heard proposals about the Euro Eurozone should break into a northern Euro, Euro and a southern Euro currency. Perhaps that, that will happen someday in the future, but uh, another type of... Uh, model would be to create a, a fiscal union in, in Europe where 
the successful exporters are taxed, and that money is then transferred through fiscal policy to southern European countries as long as they use it for education and training of their workforce and infrastructure investment, the kinds of investments that will make them more competitive in the future. Uh, I would like to add two, um, two alternatives to that, and it is the fact that there is a quasi-fiscal union by the existence of the European Central Bank, which does belong to all of the countries, and could potentially forgive uh, by by the the debt of the countries that are in problems and just forgive them that debt. That that is not new. That has happened in the past uh, around the world, so it wouldn't be uh, uh, impossible. And the other alternative is to explore uh, what we have been constructing in in Latin America, which is a unit of account, a common unit of account, just like what. Uh, the ECU was in the past before it converted into the euro in such a way that countries can retain their national currencies but have a common unit of account for intra intra-regional trade and also to serve as a as a reference for for uh, foreign exchange um, I'd like to touch on what you said earlier about jobs programs the uh, mm -hmm. new economics perspectives one of the reforms we've been pushing for is an employer of the last resort program where the government would actually put a floor on the potential downward spiral. Mm -hmm. I'd like to hear your take on how such a program would be implemented in the in the US or possibly even in Europe. Well in, in the assuming they don't for countries maybe like Great Britain where they're not on the Euro. In in the US I could comment more on. Um, okay. I think in the US we can look towards history and I had brought this up in my discussion of the 1930s where we had all kinds of federal New Deal programs that put millions of Americans to work. Uh, I mentioned the Work Projects Administration. There's also the Public Works Administration during the 1930s. These job creation agencies built LaGuardia Airport, the Midtown Tunnel, uh, all kinds of uh, bridges and airports and physical infrastructure all over the country during the 1930s. Ronald Reagan's father got through the Great Depression working for the Works Projects Administration. I mentioned the Civilian Conservation Corps, where millions of young Americans worked for the CCC, clearing underbrush, cutting fire lines, and putting out fires. And you compare that with today, where in the past year we've seen four million acres in this country scorched. Texas, Arizona, and New Mexico had the largest fires in those states' histories. And these fires are occurring in counties with 20 to 30 percent unemployment rates. So the need for work is there. The supply of labor is there. The government needs to put them together. So there are all kinds of programs for work. And I mean, from the manual labor of a CCC or a WPA to um, uh, non-manual, white-collar labor. Uh, in the past, we had uh, a national draft, which soaked up a lot of unemployment. I'm not suggesting we should go to war and have a national military draft to get a, rid of unemployment. But if we had a national service program where young Americans were given a choice of military service or civilian service, perhaps changing hospital bedpans and things like that, why not give them the same deal that the greatest generation got? You serve your country for two years and you get a tuition-free college education with living stipend. Uh, that would do an awful lot to start recreating the middle class that's been so beaten down in the past few years. Do you have anything to add to that? Or? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, the, the public uh, works or public infrastructure program would be would be great for the United States and for the world in general. You see the the multipliers that the spending generates uh, are are great for the entire world. Uh, there are some people that say, you know, the the fiscal stimulus uh, uh, is, is bad for the rest of the world, but I, I seriously believe that, you know, there's an imported uh, component of that spending and that will definitely also benefit the rest of the world uh, by a higher demand on the side of the United States. And if I could just jump in, I think a lot of the criticisms of the stimulus in the U.S. was more criticism of monetary stimulus. Right. You know, because the monetary stimulus, like the Fed's quantitative easing programs, um, you know, the Fed is essentially pushing reserves into the banking system. It can't force the banks to then lend. The banks are quite often 
taking those reserves and purchasing real estate in Hong Kong or Rio de Janeiro and, uh, you know, uh, creating bubbles, asset bubbles overseas. Mm -hmm. So monetary stimulus has um, real limits in this type of an environment. But fiscal stimulus uh, might be a little bit better. Now, the kind of fiscal stimulus that we've been going to in the last few years are tax cuts and tax credits. Right. And I, I tend to believe that that's more likely to stimulate the Chinese economy than the American economy right now. You know, Obama has talked about uh, his tax holiday putting $1,500 in the uh, pockets of uh, the average American. Well, what are they going to do with the $1,500? Are they going to go to Target and Walmart and purchase products there where most of them are now made in China, it seems? Uh, a more direct way to have fiscal policy would be to start just putting people to work and giving them the skills and the education that they need. Right. I think, um, at least here, we view the problem is that we're in a balance sheet recession right now. Mm -hmm. And in such a recession, the Fed quantitative easing doesn't work. Mm -hmm. um, and such aggregate demand programs, like a, an employer of last resort program, would really help. Mm -hmm. Something that's been brought up a lot today is that true reforms are almost impossible um, without campaign finance reforms. Um, I was wondering if you had comments on that, if you agree with it, and if you had any ways that you would like to see the current system reformed as far as how campaigns are financed. I, I do think political reform is absolutely necessary. Um, there are a lot of ways it could happen. Uh, we heard today a number of proposals to take money out of politics, to overturn Citizens United. Um, that becomes a political problem in and of itself. Um, Walter Cronkite, uh, who had been the most trusted man in America for years, according to public opinion polls, he was the, the anchor of CBS News for years. In the last decade of his life, he was advocating for free airtime along with a common cause. This was a, a common cause uh, project or part of their agenda. And the idea being that the airwaves are owned by the pub public and that we should require broadcasters in a 30 or 60 day period before an election to provide free airtime to candidates so that candidates don't have to prostitute themselves to raise corporate money just to get their message across in a 30 second commercial to, to voters. Um, you know, the Occupy Wall Street movement, a lot of their agenda, from what I'm gathering, does deal with political reform. I, I think that's basic, and um, I, w I would just add the experience of Ecuador in 2007. We had a very important political reform process where we had uh, free airtime for all the candidates distributed equally, and uh, we also had limits on how much every candidate could spend. Uh, on, on the campaign, plus, just like in other European countries or in other Latin American countries, a fixed amount of public money that went to each candidate's campaign uh, so that you could, uh, as, as much as possible, guarantee equal opportunity. So more of a public financed campaign approach as opposed to a privately financed? It's, it's a mixed approach. You have some public money and then you have caps on how much uh, the the each of the private candidates could get. Yeah, we have a Supreme Court that gets in the way yeah. of limiting private uh, contributions and spending. Uh, so that that is a problem. Yeah, based on free speech, I think. Yeah, it's First like Amendment that. decisions. And of course, it's based on, in, in part, uh, giving First Amendment rights to corporations, right. uh, you know, corporate legal personality. And there's a, a, a critique developing of that, of course. Moving forward, what do you think is necessary for governments, not just the U.S. government, but in Ecuador, in the European Union, what do you think is necessary of those governments to move, to move beyond the crisis and to create stability, which I think is the key, not just growth, but stable growth? So. I, well, I think uh, the recent experience with Greece is, a, is an example. I mean the Prime Minister of Greece goes and threatens the world that he's going to have democracy, you know, and it, it becomes a, an element of blackmail and it's really uh, scary because uh, it was a demonstration that uh, politicians, that the administrations that are in charge of government 
aren't really responding to to the will of the people and i think uh, another example of that was uh, iceland where they did have a, a referendum and it did have important policy changes in, in terms of their way of confronting the crisis so i think governments have to do what they're supposed to do and listen to the people uh, we we have a, a a philosophy in this you know when in doubt more democracy and that that's a, an alternative solution i like that yeah, yeah I, I could not agree more. And I'd say uh, perhaps that should start with the central banks. Central banks have become uh, tools of private financial institutions. Central banks should be really accountable to uh, elected governments and to a much wider uh, diversity of interests in society. So almost less central bank independence than is currently and well, currently exists? Well, I don't even consider what we have to be real independence of central banks. These are captured central banks. They're not independent of Wall Street interests. They might be technically independent of politicians in some instances, but uh, what I see are central banks that are captured by Wall Street, but for that matter, you've got elected officials <laughs> captured by Wall Street these days. Right. Uh, I like the approach of some of the institutional economists of the 1940s, people like John Commons, uh, Leon Kaiserling, who was Harry Truman's uh, chief economist of his Council of Economic Advisors, they both talked about uh, reforming the Federal Reserve Board and the regional boards of directors of the regional Federal Reserve Banks so that they did reflect a wider diversity of social interests, so that labor would be representative and consumers would be represented, and not just bankers dominating all of these boards. There was a, in, in after the, the Second World War, when uh, the IMF had an interesting role in building institutionality around the world and especially uh, people like Robert Triffin when they were setting up central banks and they also said you know we need a diversity of opinions there are exporters importers mm -hmm. the labor and the ministers for agriculture policy I mean it was it was a much more diverse uh, board of governors and directors and for money policy you know. Right, and, and that's a more independent board. It's less susceptible to capture. And it doesn't have to be run on a daily basis by the politicians if, it's, if the members are really accountable to such diverse social interests. And then one issue is that banks often claim goodwill as part of their capital as far for the Basel agreements especially, the capital requirements they need to have. Goodwill is included in this. Is it... Is it possible, really, especially with the implicit guarantees, to pull out goodwill from the uh, capital requirements? How so? Well, one issue is that a bank like Bank of America might say, well, because we're too big to fail, we have, some, we have extra capital. It's not tangible, I mean but it's implied there. Would it be possible to, when regulators are looking at the uh, capital levels um, regarding ratio, ratios and leverage ratios, to pull out the goodwill? Well, um, you're bringing up the whole subject of capital requirements, and it seems like we came through a period during the bubble when there were not really capital requirements, and now we're trying to address the problem by raising capital requirements at a time where it might be counterproductive to raise capital requirements. There are other ways to regulate the banks other than capital requirements, and one would be reserve requirements, which have fallen out of disfavor in the past generation. I know Jane Durista and, and others uh, have written about this, and um, I find that much more persuasive than focusing too much on capital requirements right now. So higher reserve requirements? Yeah. Okay. I think um, uh, you mentioned the, what is not, are known as systemically important yes. Uh, yes. financial institutions, also called systemically dangerous <laughs> financial institutions. <laughs> Just recently in Switzerland, I believe, their capital requirement was twice as much as that of a normal financial institution. So there's an approach, but I, I totally agree. I mean, during times of crisis or recession, that definitely is counterproductive. And um, in Ecuador, we did pursue a reserve requirement strategy where uh, we uh, demand that banks invest in certain types of assets uh, by, by regulation. Uh, 
and that has a, a created a demand for securities in in issues in issues that we're interested in, such as even government securities or uh, smaller financial institution securities or re real sector uh, securities, mm -hmm. and that has definitely stimulated the economy as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Do you have anything, either do you have anything more you'd like to add? Um, just to thank you for the interview, and I've heard so much of, and re read the work of people at University of Missouri at Kansas City for years, and it's a great economics department. Uh, I, I totally agree. I, I think the event today was excellent, very high quality, and uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. Well, on the behalf of New Economics Perspectives and the Econ Department at UMKC, I would like to thank you for your time. And You're I very welcome. Thank you. And good luck going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Me too.